as if I picked those songs myself. Lord, for Lord, you so we get to sing words we get to glorify you with because of what you've done for us. We are humbled by Lord our own sin, Lord, that we are so easily entangled with. And I pray, Father. Today, as we, Lord, seek to be your witnesses, Lord, that you would strengthen us. Lord, we live in a world, as was prayed earlier, that is getting darker always. Yet, Father, we thank you that as the darkness comes, light shines bright. And, Lord, it is your church. And so I pray, Father, for, Lord, this church. I pray for our time this morning, Lord, we'd be encouraged in your word and strengthened and challenged and set for the week, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated this morning and take your Bibles out, if you would, and turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. And just again, a little um, movement from Acts. As I said, we will be for a while. Uh, but I want to look this morning at 1 Peter chapter 3 and just in light of What's going on in our world? Just a reminder and just some encouragement for us as we look through the days ahead and and the needs that we have and the lead, needs we don't even know about. And so we come in here to this passage. In fact, as we look at look at this passage, reminded as we shared a little bit last week, talked a little bit about the the reformers and and the Reformation and talked about grace last week and shared just in brief just uh, some of the some of the reformers um, Wycliffe Huss Martin Luther others involved as well uh, William Tyndale with the, the scriptures and then even off, uh, students of, of theirs especially of Wycliffe uh, the Lollards we have others beyond them in the in the later days but Martin Luther, uh, remember that he kind of set forth and, and ignited the, the Reformation by nailing his 95 Theses to the doors of the church at Wittenberg. And his response was to the, the Catholic Church, as we shared last week, a little bit selling of indulgences. And that is basically to buy your way out of the, the false teaching of purgatory, which has held so many Catholics in bondage and still does today. And, and even the affirmation and the, the guarantee of heaven, which is, can't be purchased. There's no uh, grace of others who have more grace to give. It is only Christ's grace, as we talked about. And remember, grace is not just a thing. It's a, it's a person. Grace is Christ, from Christ, through Christ, by Christ only. But Luther, in standing against this, and the sale of indulgences that came in doing so, even as we, uh, one of my favorite theses is the verse, uh, thesis 32, it says this, those who believe that they can be certain of their salvation because they have indulgence, letters will be eternally damned together with their teachers. And I don't even believe Luther was saved at this time. This is early on, several years before he ultimately comes possibly to Christ and and certainly comes to Christ later as you can read through his readings, as we'll share here later. But, but the purpose of his, of nailing these theses to the doors of Wittenberg was to, to start a conversation. It never occurred to him what would actually happen. The papacy would, would uh, expunge him and, and basically the people would embrace him. He became ultimately a hero among the people and even from leaders but as he continued the papacy, just as with Wycliffe and others with Huss, that, that Luther continued to push back harder and grew more in his conviction of the authority of Scripture. Again, he was not seeking to pit himself against, against the church, but it happened naturally because of his stand on the authority of Scripture. And so it is with us as we stand firmly on the Scripture and grow stronger in the Scripture, the world naturally pits itself against the church, just naturally. 
And so it was that Luther found himself in this place of hostility as one of many during the Reformation, as I said. It's not a place where he'd want to be. John, uh, John Huss, he was burned to the stake along with William Tyndale. Not a place that any of us would want to be, but fortunately we live in a world in a, in a demographic, or rather a, a geographic, I should say, that probably wouldn't happen to us. This, however, doesn't mean that we will not suffer persecution or hostility because of the truth of the Christ. And we have noted on numerous occasions in the past of Acts that Jesus told us that we would be, suffer on account of his name. And we have seen ultimately this hostility increase over the last several weeks just by, by one court ruling on Roe versus Wade, physical attacks on crisis pregnancy centers, 18 plus physical attacks. We have senators who, who vowed to get rid of them because there's more of them than those clinics that promote and actually do abortions. It's, 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 it's just hard to even think that that would be the speech coming out of anyone's mouth, denying help to those in need because of an ideology that is dark and depraved and evil. Yet it doesn't negate the fact that there are those who believe that and those who, who are struggling with that and those who, who don't understand the evil that's in it. And that's why the church needs to be faithful and compassionate and, and clear, as we'll see this morning. But we see as well verbal attacks on, on many who would oppose the current ideologies. If you say anything against gender or marriage that we would consider biblical, it is an affront to the world, and it should be because it is antithetical to it. How do we walk this road of hostility? How do we continue in it? And, and we know obviously that the hostility was there in Acts, but, but we're going to look at what Peter has to say here. Because I think Peter was in a situation that's more similar to the, the times that we're in. How do we walk? I think Peter, the Holy Spirit, gives us some, some insight concerning this. In Peter's first letter, uh, first letter, the first epistle, First Peter, uh, has been called the epistle of the living hope. Edmund Hebert, in his introductory information of this epistle, writes that this inspired letter sets forth the hope of the believer in the midst of of hostile, of a hostile world, addressed to those who stood as strangers in the midst of an ag uh, antagonistic and oppressive world, he says, it is a ringing appeal to a steadfast endurance and unswerving loyalty to Christ. First Peter especially resonates for us today as, as Peter writes uh, and he addresses Christians, both Jewish and Gentile, who is, are, are experiencing opposition just because they're Christians. Hebert continues, he says, while there is not a hint of actual martyrdom or bloodshed or even of imprisonment or confiscation of their goods, they, are, they were being subjected to uh, fiery trials. Chapter 4, verse 12, persecutions were in the, the form of vile slander and, and calumnious, which is a word that means um, d defaming someone attacks upon them because they were Christians. They were being hated and persecuted because of their withdrawal from the licentious practices and amusements of their pagan neighbors or those around them. And it sounds familiar, doesn't it? Again, if you don't agree with and approve of the, of, of the ideologies of the day, the pagan practices set forth by society, you will have hostility you could be canceled or you could be um, pretty much lose your job. And it's a fact today. It's a sad reality today. It's not as bad as it is in other places of the world. But the signs are all there for the challenges that we face. And Peter encourages the churches 
And these, this, this, this letter is a cyclical church or a letter. It, it's, it's to many churches. 1 Peter 1.1 1, 1 says, Those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who are chosen. And these churches are the ch churches that Paul planted. We've already studied these. We looked at these and, and followed Paul on his first missionary journey. Peter here instructs them in how to respond to both potential and, and, and present hostilities. And this is what we see specifically in our text this morning. And the context of this passage is, is he, he, in chapter 2, he speaks about godly living in relation to the government. He speaks in relation to our, our, our bosses, the, our work situation. Then in chapter 3, he begins family relationships between husband and wife. And then he, he says all of this. He some says it this in verse uh, Verses 8 through 12, look at verses 8 through 12. He says, to sum up, all of, all of, to, uh, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead, for you were all called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. For the one who, des who, the one who desires life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil. He's quoting out of Psalm 34 here. And his lips from speaking deceit, he must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and, and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And then he goes on here in our, our passage here. He gives really five exhortations of preparedness for facing this hostility based on what he just said. And they are in our, in our uh, text, and just for a by way of outline for you this morning, are one, to, to be zealous. To be zealous. Oh, we're, there we go. To do good in Christ. To, to be confident. To be surrendered. To be ready. To be, a, to be of a, a good conscience. All of these are, are important as we walk as we go to work tomorrow, as we go out in the days ahead of how we're going to respond, how we're going to live day by day, how we're going to deal with this. Because you will deal with it. I don't care who you are. It will come to you. It will cross your path if it already has not. And so what Peter ultimately tells us here is to, to maintain the course. To maintain the course. That first is, he says, be zealous. Be, be zealous to do good in Christ, to do good. He says, who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? And remember the previous verses he was, he was quoting Psalm 34. That, that the one who desires life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. And so it is that, that Peter begins here. He says, who is there? To harm you if you prove to, to prove zealous for what is good. And, and here Peter is, is, is beginning here with an erotic, an erotic uh, augative, right? A, a, a question. It is a rhetorical question. Who is to harm you if you give them no reason to? And you're thinking, well, today, pretty much everybody. If you prove zealous for what is good, and ultimately, no one can harm you is what he's saying. If the Lord is for you, who can be against you, as Paul says in Romans chapter 8. But generally speaking, it's true that most cases, if you're doing good, you will not be in danger of someone harming you. As the, as the saying goes, if you are looking for trouble, it will probably find you. You'll find it. It will come to you. Right? Right? It's what we tell our children, right? We will find you out. Levi, I am your father, right? We have that, that connection. It's like, I know. And that's why moms have eyes in the back of their head. They just know. I remember a, I remember a, a situation. It wasn't me, but it was an Amy side, so I can tell it. Of, of uh, I don't know who got in trouble but finally someone confessed because somebody had to confess, even if they didn't do it. <laughs> uh, because it was, you know, you know that goes, right? Somebody's got to confess because they know somebody did wrong. I didn't do it, but I'm just going to go ahead and take it because I'm tired of 
tired of this on, ongoing thing. I think it was her brother. I think you were in trouble, right? Was it you? Yep, mm -hmm, sure. Yep, sorry. I'm, I'm, I'll pay for it. It's okay. Now, that being true, this does not mean that we will not experience harm for doing good. Today, if you support what is good, what is righteous, that is the word good means agathos. It's, a, it's, it's intrinsically that which is good according to God's word. What is what, according to his moral standard, what that's what we're saved to do, as we'll see here in a minute. But but we know that in doing good and even speaking good and standing for good, such as the sanctity of life, biblical womanhood or manhood, biblical marriage between a biological male and a female, you could suffer. You again are probably going to have hostility in the certain circles. But this doesn't mean that we compromise the truth or avoid it. That we stop being zealous for what is good. What God has called to do, we are to be always good. In fact, Matthew 5.16 tells us, Jesus, remember the Sermon on the Mount, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works. And glorify your Father who is in heaven. We're to be a witness of that good. In fact, just earlier there in 1 Peter 3, verse 9, he says, We are not returning evil for evil, insult for insult, but giving blessing instead. For we are called for this very purpose, that you might inherit blessing. We are to respond in a way that is righteous. And it is hard then for our enemies but we are to be zealous. We are to be zealous for, I think we're, I'm going blind here, so just so you know. We are to, to prove, prove, again, you know, means to, to come, to be self-evident, zealous. Zealous means to be strongly devoted. We know what zealot means. But we're to prove, we're to become self-evident become self within us. We're to prove to them our, our zeal for Christ. And Proverbs 16, 7 says, when a man weighs are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies at peace with him. Does it mean always? No, but it means that that's what we're to do regardless. And often it does. In fact, in fact it's, it is, it's picturesque of, of what we are to be as Christ. It is hard for our enemies. In fact, earlier Peter reminded us in chapter 1, verse, or chapter 2, verse 20, he says this, for what credit is there if you, if you sin and are harshly treated? What credit is there? And you endure it with patience. But if you, when you do what is right and suffer for what is uh, it patiently, and you impatiently endure it, this finds favor with God. I think an example of this is uh, several weeks ago, maybe some of you met a young man who sat in the front row here. And it's usually, you know, people don't sit in the front row usually. Just, just, just people who are, you know, a little bit. Anyway, Andrew, Andrew Karen. I don't know if you've met him. He had a little red shirt on. His wife did. Said, uh, t I think it said tiny. Their shirt said tiny uh, heartbeats or hearts. Heartbeat. Uh, tiny heartbeat ministries. And they do a ministry. They go around, actually do some of the heavy lifting. They go around to colleges and campuses and, and through sidewalk preaching. They actually uh, stand uh, and preach the gospel and, uh, uh, and expose what happens in abortion and, and share. It's, it's pretty, pretty amazing. These young, they're 20 some years old. And we had them over for, for lunch after service and, and listened and shared some of their ministry, which we may be involved in some later uh, as a church. But he told me that what happens is, is that people just pretty much scream at them and yell at them. And, uh, but he says what happens is, and what they do is that they'll, they'll uh, minister in a way that they're not just them, but there's people within the crowd. They're, they're people who don't have the shirts on or whatever. They're just asking questions. What do you think about this? What do you think about this? So there's conversations going on. And not everybody's screaming. But what happens is, is that what he said is a lot of people see what we're doing and they see our response to them. And that we're just faithful and we'll see here that it'll fit in with the context of everything we're saying here. 
but we respond with a gentle answer. We don't scream, we don't yell back, we don't get angry. And many people respond to that through our bystanders and see the difference in the character of the communicator and just the presence of Christ that is there and what is going on and just just speaking to these young people very inspiring even they'll do sidewalk uh, preaching as well uh, at, at the uh, at uh, uh, outside the school they'll just set up a, a picture and they'll start sharing asking questions and and people are mocking them and stuff but people are out sharing the gospel with them and it's opportunities that they have and it's and uh, something that I, I think that inspire us to be involved in it's my blood moving a little bit. I hope it does yours. But there's that picture that we give to be zealous. They are zealous for the Lord. They're faithful. They're zealous to do what is good, to, to, to share, to speak, to speak the truth in love. And in fact, Proverbs backs this up, uh, chapter 15, verse, verse 21. It says, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And it certainly does, doesn't it? If you want to stir up anger, just raise your voice with somebody because they'll match your voice. The same way with any other situation, any situation. So we have this example. Peter tells us that such zealousness for doing what is good and Christ-like really should lead to a confidence for us as we go out. And that's the second point we have here. But even if you should suffer, he says, for the sake of righteousness. In other words, he says, not always will people respond. He said, but even if you do suffer... For the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation. And do not, he says, be troubled by it. Righteousness here correlates to do what is good. What is good and righteous. This is, this is or in this, there is always the, the possibility, as I said, of suffering. But in being zealous for good will give us confidence when suffering, for, for we're suffering for what is right, righteous before God. And as Jesus says in John 15, they don't hate you, they hate me. They hated me before they hated you. And this was the confidence of all the reformers. They, they were confident in, in, in their faith in Christ. They were zealous for the word of God, faithful to Christ. The verb here, suffer, uh, uh, pasco, means to be fit, both physical and mental. It wasn't just physical but mental. And that's really what happens in most of the cases for us. It's a mental attack. It's an attack on you. It's an attack on your family. It's an attack in the sense of, and it just gets you up and they want to get you. They want to pull out of you and they want to argue. And I love it, what we learn in Acts chapter 17, the apostle Paul, as he's sharing the gospel, he wasn't in the arguments. He was just stating the fact. And then he, and he closes, and the God of all creation calls all to repent. Let me just leave you with that, right? Let me just leave you with the gospel. Let me leave you with the truth. Let me lead you with this anvil. I'm not here to yell with you, but we'll all stand before God someday, and what are you going to say to him? It is the word of God. The reformer suffered both. Some might remember, again, from our past studies of Luther, that Luther did not go to the stake. He wasn't burned to the stake. He was threatening his possibility. He knew it was a possibility. He'd seen those who'd gone before him. But the more he stood for righteousness and holding forth the purity of the gospel as he, as he grew in his faith and the authority of Scripture, the stronger the opposition became, and it will become stronger. And again, he knew what happened, but without exception, he was faithful to the Lord. In April, 5th, uh, April of uh, 1521, he nailed the 95 Theses in 1517. 1521, he was summoned before Charles V, the Emperor of Rome, and at the Diet of Worms. Okay, it's not, it's not what, you know, eating grasshoppers or anything like that. It's actually uh, Diet, uh, Worms, Germany. Diet is a, is, means, refers to an official meeting. So next time you need an official meeting, just tell your boss, hey, can we have a diet of, you know, whatever. Let's see what he says. Luther, though he was told he'd have safe passage, was fully expecting to meet his death when he went. Huss was told the same thing, and Huss did meet his death. He was arrested and burned at the stake, so there's something to go on. It was 100 years before. 
and Luther believed that he was really the, the next person and that Huss spoke about, and, uh, which is a, another for another time to talk about. But when Luther was directed to affirm all that he had written, we remember he was asked, a time, asked for a time just to look over all that he's written, making sure if this is what I'm going to die for, I make sure it's right. Make sure it's what I believe is true. Yet he, he's just like us. We think, well, Luther and all these guys, they were just men. They, were just so, they weren't afraid of anything. Listen to, to this prayer that was recorded the night, uh, that night uh, by one of the historians. It says this. He, he says, oh, almighty and everlasting God, how terrible is this world? Uh, something that we probably pray to currently. Behold, it openeth its mouth to swallow me up, and I have so little trust in thee. His faith was shaken. How weak is the flesh, and, 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 and Satan now strong. If it is only in the strength of this world that I... I must put my trust, all is over. My last hour has come, my condemnation has been pronounced. Oh God, oh God. Oh God, do thou help me against all the wisdom of this world. Do this, thou shouldest do this, thou alone, for this is not my work but thine. I have nothing to do here, nothing to contend for with these great ones of the world. I should desire to see my days flow on peaceful and, ha on peaceful and happy. But the cause is thine, and it is a righteous and eternal cause. And he goes on and says more, but, the, but this is the mental and physical suffering that, that is conveyed by, by Peter's hearers as well as as the reformers, and you think about it, even as you, as the days will come, you will you will deal with this. These are going to be things or challenges that will come. Whether it's a work situation, whether it's the the application of 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 having to uh, submit to certain things, it'll weigh on you mentally. You're you're going to be overwhelmed spiritually. You will have a hard time sleeping. It will cause irritability in your in your family in your in your marriage even and it may have already caused it and so it is that peter comforts us here in our text telling us but even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness he says listen you you are blessed <laughs> say what you are blessed Blessed, markerios, means happy. A happy result is, is more than just a happy feeling. It's an inner joy of sanctification that comes only from Christ. He is the source and the substance. Remember, we talked about last week about grace and, and uh, mentioned Paul in chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians, verse 9 and following, about the grace of God. My grace is sufficient. Paul suffered these same things. My grace is sufficient. And remember, grace is not just a thing. It's a, a person. It's Christ. And this is where our, our faith meets the road. It's, it's this moment there is a communion with Christ that we share in his sufferings, but also a future blessing of what is to come. Later, Peter says in 1 Peter 4, 13 through 14, he says, but to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Paul speaks of the same thing to the Romans. He says and tells us in Romans 8, 18, For I consider the suffering of this present time not, not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed to us. Speaking about the things to come. Paul again in 2 Corinthians to the Corinthians, he said in chapter 4, verse 17, For momentary light affliction is producing for us an, e an eternal weight of glory for beyond all, uh, from all, beyond all comprehension. 
He says, listen, you're living in a present. I'm living in the heavenly places where I've been seated, as we read in Ephesians. I am laying my treasure up in heaven. I know that this home is just temporary. And I see a greater glory, and that is the glory of Christ. It is in our suffering that we draw closest to our Savior. James tells us this in our trials. Consider all joy when you encounter various trials. Reminds us to pray if we, if we lack wisdom. There is well the, the promise of, of eternal blessing as, again, as uh, continued all, well is really based in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 10 through 12. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It will mark you as a believer. It will affirm you as a believer. And they, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil things against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So it is that Peter says, but even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And he says further, those who suffer, he says, therefore do not fear their intimidation. Do not be troubled. Do not be troubled. This, this comes out of Isaiah, and Isaiah here speaking to Judah, not being troubled with what's going on in, 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 in the, the northern kingdom who are going to come under discipline from Assyria. He says, do not fear their fear. Don't fear what they fear. Literally, it's what it says. In fact, Weist in his New Testament uh, Word study says, be not affected with the fear by their fear which they strive to inspire in your heart. Others who try to inspire fear in your heart, don't allow it. Do not be troubled, the word troubled here, to agitate, to take away calmness of mind, make restless, to strike one's spirit with fear and dread, to render anxious and distress. And that's exactly what fear does, doesn't it? It it debilitates us. And all we think about is that fear. Believe me, I'm, I'm speaking from on low here, all right? I am speaking from, from experience. I know well, Philippians 4, 6. Be anxious about nothing. <laughs> but everything with prayer, supplication, make your needs known to the Lord. Peter says, don't be intimidated. Don't be feared. Don't be troubled. Do not have anything to fear. Why? Because ultimately, our, any fear that we should have as believers is, is taken away because we're in Christ. He tells those who don't know, he says this in Matthew 10, 28. He says, do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both the soul and, and the body in hell. That's whom is the true fear, and we don't have to fear. We have nothing to fear. We have everything to gain. Again, remember Peter is quoting from earlier from Psalm 34. He says, for the eyes, he says, of the Lord, he says, are toward the righteous. And his ears attend to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And you can imagine the hostility that the reformers and those who have gone before us and those who, who live in, in demographics where it's not as, not as plush as ours. Where they literally have to worry about their own lives for accepting Christ. We're familiar with the words of Paul in, in, in Romans 8.31. What then shall we say to these things? That is... If God is for us, who can be against us? And he goes through the list. What can separate us from the love of God? If God is for us, who can be against us? David wrote this in Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? 
whom shall I dread? Verse 3, though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear, he says. Though war rise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. I shall be confident. This is what zealous to do good, those who are in the Lord, is to be confident. Should be psalm, not palm, just in case. God, I see you pointing that out over there, you, you know, grammarians. Can hardly see it. It's there, but it's called fast hands. Now, where was I? Yes. The Lord is the light of my life and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? Anyone? It's rhetorical. And again, verse 3. Though a host to camp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war rise against me in spite of this, I shall be confident. I shall be confident. Now, how can we possess such confidence in the face of potential hostility? It continues. We're, we're zealous. We should be confident, but it goes on. We should be surrendered. We should be those who sanctify Christ as Lord in our hearts. And this is, this is important in relation to where we're at. Notice the flow of what Peter is saying. Zealous to be good even, for, even to your enemies. And, to be, and if you do suffer, you are blessed. But do not fear those who could cause you harm, but stand firm in your faith in Christ. And this is really where the rubber meets the road. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Sanctify, we know, it means, it means set apart to be holy or as holy. We're set apart in Christ. We're in Christ. And he says not only be set of Christ, but he says set, Lord, set, set Christ as Lord of your hearts. He is Lord of your hearts. Be surrendered to his control, to, to his will, to wherever it may lead you. That he's either Lord or he's not. There's no later Lord, there's Lord. He is Lord. And you think about this, well, yeah, yeah, he is. He is. Let's be practical about it. When difficulty comes, what, what, where do you go? Do you fall apart or is he Lord? Do I fall apart or is he Lord? Do I stand and say, Lord, it's all you, as, as did the Reformers? Listen to the last words of John Huss. He was asked to recant several times. He was given some time to recant. He wouldn't. He was dressed up in his vestige as a priest and then taken off again, stripped of the symbols of his office to, to humiliate him. And when they took the cup from him, he declared his hope that Christ would not take the cup of mercy from him. When they committed his soul to the devil, he committed it to Christ, says the, this uh, biographer says. Outside, they led him to a stake. After kneeling in prayer, he was chained by the neck Wood was piled around him, urged one last time to renounce his, his errors. He replied that he had never taught things charged of him, that they were lies. But then he said, quote, The principal intentions of my preaching and all my other acts of writings was solely that I might turn men from sin. And in that truth of the gospel that I wrote, taught, and preached in accordance with the sayings and ex ex expositions of the holy doctors, that's the scriptures, the, the apostles, I am willingly, I am willingly, gladly to die today. Would you say that John Huss sanctified Christ in his, as Lord in his heart? It was the point where I'm either going to follow this path or I'm going to submit to this path. Is it easy? No, but God's grace is sufficient for it in the moment that we're in it. But it happens in little things for us young people. Decisions you have to make with your friends to take the right way, to, to say what is right, to speak the truth in love, or, or not do and, and choose to walk away what you know is not good and righteous. It's contrary to being zealous for what is good. 
And yes, you may be persecuted. You may be verbally said and called things. Believe me, when I got saved, none of my friends were saved. And they said all kinds of things and tried to tempt me and tried to get me to do things and to fall back in sin, even putting a, a, a wager on whether Amy and I would remain married or not. They failed. But it cost me some of my friends. But, do I, but by the character and zealous good deeds, they didn't stay away. They didn't keep that way. And so it is that you need to remain zealous for what is good. Even if you are persecuted for Christ's sake, you will be blessed. You are blessed. But ultimately, you need to sanctify Christ in your, in your heart, as Lord in your heart. You need to be faithful. You need to make the this, make this stand. I am set apart for you, Lord. Whatever may come, I'm set apart from you. And you need to be prepared then to give a response. You need to give a response. And that response is, I have so much for you. To be ready to give an answer for the hope that's in you. Always being ready to, de to, def to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. Yet with gentleness and reverence. And there's much more we can say about this. But what I want to say about this and make clear to you is that Peter tells us that we are not to, to sit around in fear. We are not to, uh, we, we have no reason to fear. We have Christ on our side, sanctified, set apart in him as the one who is in control of all things, even our sufferings, and understood to be by his hands, brought about for his greater glory. And so rather than cower in fear, we are to be, be clarions and trumpets of the truth, and specifically the gospel. This defense here, this word, we get our word apologia from it, literally. Apologetics, meaning to make a defense of the faith against objections and misrepresentations. Every Christian, Peter says, should be able to be ready to make that defense and share the truth of this hope. And ultimately, and specifically, it would be the gospel. That means that we should not only be able to explain the gospel, but, but why we believe it. The scriptures that proclaim it and the God who, who has given it. And this is a response. Again, we see this with the Apostle Paul, right? The Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 17, what did he do? He went, explained it, he went and, and he gave a defense of the word of God and says, this God, this is the God whom you, you have, have, uh, have no name for. I know his name, I place it on there. And at the end he just says, listen, this is the anvil. And he left it with him. No, no need to argue. God has the last word, and God will have the last word. And he'll have the last word with each one of us. He has the last word. To give an account for the hope, the living hope is, we know is the hope that we have in Christ that's being born again, the living hope through the resurrection of, uh, and, uh, of Christ, which we see in chapter 1, verse 3. Every Christian, Peter says, would be able and ready to make this defense. Our response is always first and foremost to share the gospel. Peter says we should always be ready to do so with reverence and great gentleness, with gentleness and reverence. And this is important to us. Uh, in fact, we just talked about this a little bit in our, our newcomers class, just how we respond to the, to the world and the unbeliever and to those who are even, even uh, uh, not along in the faith, maybe less mature in the faith. And how we speak and how we think about it, how we respond to them and how we encourage them. We can get caught up in our, our, our circles and we can say things that, that, that where they're not at. And sometimes we can, we can rattle off things that may be offensive to others because we're in our Christian circle, our Christian ease. But even to the unbeliever, to be able to understand, to be able to walk in their shoes and understand that, that as I said earlier, those who, those who are, are, are supporting the agendas of the day are, are those who need Christ and, and they are genuine in their heart. They genuinely believe it. And they are genuinely scared. And so we speak the truth to them in, in, in gentleness and reverence. We're willing to take on their offense as they may be angry with us, not responding just with the gospel. 
if we truly believe in the power of the word of God, to be able to reach them. But we need to be prepared to do it, and we're not to if, if, if ultimately we haven't sanctified Christ as Lord in our heart. First of all, that we're believers, and then we live in relation to him as our Lord. We are to let the word of God be the only offense. Colossians 3 or 4 verse 6 says, Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. God will give you the words. 2 Timothy 2, 24 to, 40, to 26 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26 says this, The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, that perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Think about this this week and the conversations you've had in the past. Maybe some conversations that you might change. I know I've had some. How are we to live in the face of potential hostility? Be zealous. Be confident. Be surrendered. Be ready. Lastly, that is, be of a good conscience in Christ. And keep a good conscience too, so that in the things in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior of Christ will be put to shame. Again, it goes back to verse 13. Be zealous for what is good. For it is better if God should will it to do so, that you suffer for doing what is right rather than doing what is wrong. Remember, God is in every circumstance. And that's why we can trust even that person who may be screaming at you or upset at you. God is sovereign in it. God is sovereign in that opportunity for you and has enabled you to do it. But keep a good conscience. What is a conscience? Conscience. God, this is not Webster's, okay? God implanted ability to evaluate the moral quality of your actions. Such evaluation is in relation to the knowledge of the truth. So our conscience is not something that is, is not just the Christians have, it's just general. Every, everyone has a conscience. It's based on, based on God placing that moral quality of action in, in their heart. That's why Romans chapter 1 says man's without excuse. But it's based on the truth. And the reason, you know, why was America so good? Of, you know, why, would they, why have things changed? Uh, because more and more people are not hearing the truth, even, even from our society. It used to be a, a nation of laws, a nation, a, a nation of basic moral truth, which was God's truth. And so a conscience was convicted over such things, where now consciences are, are seared, being hardened. And so it is men are without conscience. And the stuff that uh, I spoke of, of, of uh, Andrew and, uh, and his team talking about what people would get in their face and say about babies and about abortion reveals a depraved, seared conscience. And the mocking of, of the Lord. Romans 2.15 defines our conscience. It's... Our conscience both accuses us and defends us, but it's based on the truth. It's that God-given blessing ultimately to all men. For the unbeliever, again, his conscience is un unregenerate. It accuses him or her, but it's no power to change them, only to direct them based on the knowledge in which they have, their understanding of truth that they have, and and so it is that you even see them coming up with bad theology, though wanting to be religious. A good conscience is only brought about through the cleansing of Christ, Hebrews 9.14, as we see on the screen. How much more, he, the writer of Hebrews says, well, the blood of Christ, who brought the eternal spirit, offered himself without blemish to God, 
cleanse our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. It's only through the sprinkling of the blood of Christ that our conscience are cleared. And Peter says we must keep or maintain a good conscience by being obedient to Christ and faithful to deal with sin in our lives, to be faithful in season, ultimately and out of season, as Paul would say in teaching the word, but ultimately in our own hearts of being zealous. Paul said, we, uh, Paul said he did his best to maintain always, in Acts 24, verse 16, he says, to maintain always a blameless conscience before God and before man. And doing this will be above reproach. And therefore, those who slander will be put to shame. Notice Philippians says, in no way be alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you. And that too from God, for it is, for to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Those are heavy and real words for us. This was the conviction of, of Martin Luther when he stood before the Diet of Worms and was asked a final time to, re, to repudiate his books and teaching as there, he replied this way. Since then, he says, your majesty and your lordship desires a simple reply. I will answer with horns, without horns, he says, and without teeth, without, without anger, without scoff. Unless I am convicted by scripture and, and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience, he says, is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. God help me, amen. He wouldn't go against his Lord. His conscience wouldn't let him as a believer. My friends, as we go into the days ahead, be zealous to do good in Christ. Be confident in suffering, even when you do suffer for the sake of Christ. Be surrendered to Christ and to his lordship. Sanctify your heart. Be ready to give an answer for the hope that's in you. Leave them with the word. That's what you need to leave them with so that you're of good conscience, that you're of good conscience. We are not without hope as those in the world unless, unless you don't know Christ, which may be the case this morning. If you're here and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, I don't assume anyone's saved. And so it is that the gospel is given. Christ came for sinners such as you and I. He went to the cross to pay the penalty of sin sin that we couldn't pay for, sin that we were condemned for, our sins. Jesus, who knew no sin, Paul says, became sin on our behalf that we might be declared righteous based on his righteousness. And so it's clear the scriptures tell us if we confess with our heart that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Confess him as Lord. For it's a heart that we believe in are justified, declared righteous, based on his merit, not our own. And it's with our mouth that we are confessed and are saved. There'll be fruit and evidence of it. If there's no evidence of fruit that you're saved, you should fear. You should fear. And you should cry out to God. For the rest of us who know Christ, be zealous. Be confident, be surrendered, be ready, and be of a good conscience. Father, thank you this morning just for your encouragement as we go out this week and our conversations that we have, that we just do good. Lord, we do speak the truth in love. We're ready, Lord, to take whatever comes our way because we're surrendered to your lordship, to you. You are Lord. You are in charge. You're in charge of that moment. If we suffer, it's by your will. If we have, we have uh, that interaction, is by your will, but it's your truth that sets free, and we need to walk in their shoes, have compassion to speak the truth in love, 
with gentleness, Lord. And I pray for the one here who doesn't know you, that even now, right where I'm speaking and praying, that they would pray to you, Lord, I am not saved. If I were to die tonight, I know that I spend eternity in hell because of my sin that separates me from you. But Lord, I believe, Jesus, that you died on a cross for my sins, that you did come. You did live a perfect life because you are God in human flesh. You died on a cross as in my place, taking upon my sin and offering your righteousness to me as if, as if I lived it to redeem me, to save me. In Jesus, I believe. And I confess you as my Lord and Savior. I believe that, that you were raised from the dead. And I believe in my heart that you will declare me righteous based on your merits. And I will confess it. I will confess it. And reveal what's in my heart that I am truly saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Will you stand with me as we close this morning? And we lift up our voices to give praise and speak to the Lord. Come thou fount of every blessing. Amen.